Today's presenter, Russell Jackman, is a graduate of the McGeorge School of Law, University of Pacific, and was admitted to the State Bar of California in June of 1994. He has been vice chair of the California State Bar's Law Practice Management and Technology Committee and a member since 1996. He works specifically with law offices and attorneys that need to get the most out of their legal technology and creates PowerPoint presentations for opening statements, direct examinations, and closing statements to be used in court and can work with attorneys directly to filter their documents and images so that they have the most powerful visual presentations possible. He also works with law offices and solo attorneys to upgrade their older systems to new ones, troubleshooting existing setups and training attorneys and staff on Microsoft programs. He is available for remote access consulting on technology related issues. So please feel free to contact him at any time. So let's first talk about the biggest question of all is what is cryptocurrency? And even when I have done all the research and gone through everything that I've gone through for this, my complete understanding of exactly what it is, I can't say that I really understand fully what it's all about. I mean, I because it is hard because it isn't something that's material. And when it's something that isn't material, that you can actually put your hands on, it's hard to give you an explanation as to what it is. If it was a piece of gold or if it was silver or if it was, you know, a pound of salt or whatever, you know, you would use or shells or, or, or you know, bottle caps if you're a, a Fallout fan, you would know that the, the, what you could see it, you could hold it, you could get a tangible hands-on experience of what the you're exchanging things for so you know 10 of this for a chicken and a uh, hundred of this for a, a tool and a thousand of this for you know uh, uh you know uh, uh, a house or something you know it's easy to to to, to put that into terms but when you talk about cryptocurrency it's a number. And so basically you're talking about ownership of a number and it's how that number is found and what that number represents to people that gives it its value. And if you really go backwards and think, well, you know what? I guess that's what really all money is, right? The dollar bill is what we believe is backed by a particular government or a particular standard and that the government will be there to honor that debt, giving that particular money its value, or it's got some other way or means of, of being backed, like when we have the gold stamp. Um, it's not really that way with cryptocurrency, yet cryptocurrency continues to build in value and build in popularity. So let's go and investigate a little bit more about what cryptocurrency is all about. It's a digital or virtual currency that's secured by cryptography, which makes it nearly impossible to counterfeit or double spend. So there is a uniqueness to each particular Bitcoin, for lack of a better term, because there's the, the Bitcoin is just one of many different cyber currencies. Um, but let's just use Bitcoin as an example because it's the most well known. The virtual currency itself is backed by its uniqueness and the fact that it represents a algorithmic formula that nobody else could ever come up with. So it's I always thought that it was based on prime numbers. And so, you know, we just go one, three, five, you know, seven, you know, uh, uh, and so forth, 11 or whatever, and continue to just move forwards. And each person 
owns that particular prime number in this system, but it's not actually prime numbers. It's, it's a sequence of data that's known as a block that produces a particular pattern when the Bitcoin hash algorithm is applied to it. So in other words, the Bitcoin hash is the algorithm, is the key that unlocks access to that particular block of transaction that are in that sequence. And when you and another person agree to that, then that is what gives it its value. And the, the size of the bounty reduce is reduced as Bitcoins are, are, are mined around the world, as these particular algorithms set a number in place and take that number out of circulation. Theoretically, there are an infinite number of numbers that could still be taken through that different algorithms and different cyber currencies. But for a particular science, cyber currency, that number is quote unquote taken, used up, and then you can't access it again. And then that transaction is secured by this Bitcoin hash or whatever cyber currency hash is being used to, to secure that specific number. And so that's what gives it its value. And, and you know, I, I not to, go on too much of a, a side note on this, but the only way I can really compare this is like the value of, of art or comic books, which I'm, I, I'm not a Bitcoin collector, but I am a comic book collector. Or I was when I was a, a younger lad and, and, and things are worth what people want to pay for them. I mean, that's, that's, that's always the case. I mean, what things, some things were popular, you know, years ago, um, you know, otter pelts and, and, and whalebone, you know, uh, tests and, and, and uh, uh, walrus tests that were scrimshot. And then things, you know, change as far as people's fashions. You know, no one wants to buy a fur coat anymore. Nobody wants to display their scrimshaw ivory to their friends. So collectible um, objects are are really in the eye of the beholder and the perception of the people who project that value into it. So it's, you know, I certain comic books that I bought when I was a young person, I thought would be worth a lot of money. They aren't worth very much now, but then there's, there's uh, comics that I bought and then they suddenly make movies out of them. Like, uh, when I bought the Guardians of the Galaxy in the 70s, because I happened to just like the characters and thought the stories were really interesting. I didn't know that, you know, in the late 2010s and, and, and early 2020s that they'd become a major movie franchise. And suddenly the value of those comics went up tremendously when they were worth only, you know, maybe a, a, a dollar or two more when I originally bought them, now they're worth a lot of money. So you never really know when things like this are going to catch on and become a bigger deal. And that's what certainly happened with Bitcoin. It started off as a very low amount per coin. And now, you know, people are talking about, you know, that they could be worth 10,000, 15,000, $20,000. Of course, that could be one day and then it can drop down to five, or three, two thousand, one thousand dollars the next day. So that is one of the other uh, issues that that we certainly have with cryptocurrency. Um, now, many cryptocurrencies are decentralized networks based on what's called a blockchain. That's so we talked about that you have each person getting a transaction represented as a block, and those are collected together in what's called a blockchain and that particular cryptocurrency owns that blockchain and that's that's distributed a distributed ledger that's in, enforced by really no one in particular that's the other part that i had really trouble trying to find out while researching this there really is no one computer that 
is in charge of storing all this data. It just sort of floats around in the network that we have right now, the entire cyber network that we have, and shifts based on access and use and processor power and server availability and so forth. And it's very hard to track. So that's one of the reasons why cryptocurrencies are popular is that they are used for not just legit transactions, but also illegitimate transactions. And because they have no central authority, they are immune to government interference or manipulation. It's, it's, it's uh, one of the things that is both a positive and negative about our currency is that the U.S. government, you know, backs it. And so if the U.S. government is having, you know, troubles, then our, our uh, currency is worth less. And when the U.S. government and the U.S. economy is doing well, our currency is worth more internationally. But we're tied, to, uh, the dollar bill is tied to the fate of the, of the United States, whereas Bitcoin is not tied to the thing. Cyber currencies are not uh, uh, tied to the fate of the United States. And so they can basically, you know, rise and fall due to their own internal popularity and management and, and ability to be reliable source of, of monetary transactions and uh, working as far as um, uh, a cryptocurrency is concerned, not worry about government interference, but also it, the government does not have the ability to to look in on these currencies or these transactions. They may be very difficult to actually tax and be able to um, come up with a uh, uh, a way of tracking the income that is based through cyber currency, and so. Like, for instance, in California and in other states where uh, uh, cannabis is legalized, but not on a federal level, uh, cyber currencies are um, being used uh, for a way to circumvent uh, uh, not having to work with federal taxes and to be able to, to uh, do transactions or uh, to, with clients on a large scale, like ones that want to do big purchases of cannabis that don't want to um, have to declare them to the federal government or even possibly the state government. So blockchains are organizational methods for uh, ensuring that the transactional data is secured and no one else has access to it. It, that's a major part of uh, how sorry, cryptocurrencies work. Um, uh, and it has already affected the way that banks work, the way that the laws are looking at trying to capture that income, trying to keep people from um, circumventing the law and being able to uh, uh, launder money, basically. Through, uh, through cyber current cryptocurrencies. Uh, and they are uh, definitely, it's, it's it, one of the biggest problems that cryptocurrencies have also is that it really, for a lot of people, represents this get rich quick scheme concept that people like are always, you know, kind of, easy to, to fall for in most circumstances. And because there's no government regulation on them, it's very easy to turn a cryptocurrency scheme into a Ponzi scheme. And I guess cryptocurrency, not necessarily a scheme, but, but to turn a cryptocurrency business into a Ponzi scheme, it's, there's the, especially because there's nothing to actually physically get. And there's nothing to, it's one thing when you put money into say a real estate Ponzi scam 
and you go and it's supposed to be an apartment complex and you go and you visit it, you don't see an apartment at all. Um, then you get the idea that there's no, that that's a scam and, and there's something going on. But when you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't really maintain it yourself or, or monitor it yourself, you have to sort of rely on your cryptocurrency provider to tell you what's going on with your money, what's going on with your information. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it can be, unfortunately, uh, uh, a really out of control situation that gets out of hand very quickly because you don't have any way of monitoring it. And so, um, somebody can really lead you by the nose and, and, uh, be able to, uh, con people out of, out of funds, which is something that we'll talk about later. Um, uh, so Bitcoin was created in 2009 by a man who has, who has an alias of Satoshi Nakamoto, but the real identity of Satoshi Nakamoto has never been established. There are no physical Bitcoins that correspond with dollar bills and Euro notes. They exist only on the internet and usually in digital wallets. Ledgers known as blockchains are used to keep track of the existence of Bitcoin. It can be given directly or received from anyone who has a Bitcoin address by a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. And Bitcoin also trades on various exchanges around the world, which is how its price is established. So it sort of became its own thing by itself. It, it established, it was, you know, in 2009, somebody just said, here it is, and people started putting money into it, which gave it value. And because people perceive it as it have it having value, it has value. As long as people have a perception that there's value in it. I know that sounds like very circular logic, but maybe that's maybe it, it's pointing out sort of the folly of money in itself being more of an illusory concept and it's something that you point to and say this piece of paper is worth this you know item then it is something that we can now totally take control of i mean when money was obviously first created nobody knew that we would have these digital systems that we have electronic systems that would be working on computers so much and using so much digital transactions that that's how we would be doing things more than we would do it by cash by transmitting physical items between each other barter and so forth and because that change is happened faster. I mean, 2009 is not really that long ago. When you think about like changing the way money works or the way we perceive money um, for how many, you know, centuries and how many millennium we've had dollars and, and coins and, and notes and whatever to represent things that uh, other items that we wanted to, 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 to get from other people, that is a big change in how we think. And I'm not sure yet a lot of people, including myself, are quite able to get our heads around it and are willing to embrace it as much as, as some other people are. So the advantages and disadvantages of cryptocurrency. Um, well, one of the advantages that we've talked about is that it's easier to transfer funds between two parties without the need for a third party like a bank or credit card company. Transfers are instead secured by public keys and private keys, the form of inventive incentive systems, the proof of work or proof of stake. So, so the, the proof of work uh, we'll talk about later is something that, or proof of stake shows that you have gotten that particular transaction number in the blockchain, secured it, 
and that that's yours, and that you have the Bitcoin that corresponds or the whatever cryptocurrency that corresponds to unlock that transaction and be able to access it, okay? I hope that that gets clearer. The more I, I explain it, the clearer it seems to me. When I keep when I kept reading it over and over again, ah, it's so hard to understand. But I think I'm, I'm myself. The more I explain this, I'm getting it a little bit better. Um, uh, so what happens is that you have a wallet or account address, and it has a public key, so that people could find it to, to, to access the transaction. But the private key is only known to the owner and used to sign transactions. So the public key is what you use to the public, obviously, to get them to, or someone else, say, a third, a set, another person to say, okay, I'm willing to buy this Bitcoin or do a transaction with this Bitcoin address in this wallet for this specific person. And once the private key is, is given, to to or access is given by the person who has the private key then the transaction is signed and then fund transferred or completed with minimal processing fees or maybe none at all allowing users to avoid fees charged by banks financial institutions for wire transfers so basically this all kind of came as an answer to the way that banks and financial institutions were skimming off the top when they charge a lot of money for wire transfers that normally, you know, they get, you know, 10% fee and so forth. And they charge maybe $20, $30 a transaction. The uh, doing a transaction through cryptocurrency uh, means can often be maybe like, you know, uh, uh, maybe a 1% transaction fee and maybe sometimes like minimum fee of like, you know, 10 cents or something. So, I mean, that's just, just throwing it out there as an example. It's, uh, so usually they can be a fraction of it because there's really no middleman. There's no, the, the, except for the, the provider of the actual Bitcoin itself, the cryptocurrency um, provider is the only one but that's all automated so they don't have to have a person they don't have a bank they don't have a, a big building that they're having to finance to make this all happen they don't have commercials they don't have i mean they're just they're just there to electronically process the transaction and keep that wallet secure so that these transactions can happen without interference so again i hope that makes some sense but there are obviously disadvantages to this. And we talked about it, which is the fact that the uh, uh, anonymous nature of cryptocurrency makes them well-suited for illegal activities such as money laundering and tax evasion. Um, uh, but uh, 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 some cryptocurrencies are more private than others. It's it's It's... Like any tool that human beings come up with, there's a a positive side to it and a negative side to it. That's like, you know, a hammer. You can use a hammer to build a house or you can hit someone on the head with it. It's it's it, the 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 cryptocurrency itself is a neutral technology. It's not made to be evil. It's not her its purpose is not to necessarily run someone out of business or allow illegal transactions to happen without government um, um, uh, uh, government interference but then again it can be used for that because it has that ability that's how it can be used now on a situ in a situation where the government is out of control say a place like north korea or Russia or China, s cryptocurrencies are extremely popular because they want a way around government interference. But in a place like the United States, maybe that's not such a positive thing. You know, that's a good question. You know, another, you know, 
problem that we have to deal with when we're talking about uh, uh, working with uh, these kind of uh, uh, currency. So this is an illustration as best as I could find to sort of explain how the cryptocurrency works and how some of the terms that we're talking about ex are explained a little bit by illustrating what what they are and how how they're related. So, so we have at the top, which is the blockchain, the digital ledger, which transactions made in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency are recorded chronologically and publicly. Then you have a transaction. So that's a transfer of cryptocurrency value that is broadcast to the network and collected into those blocks. The hash function is, uh, is, is any function that's allowed to fix into space what has been done as far as the transaction. It's the, the thing that decodes the, uh, the cryptography so that you can figure out that transaction. Miners are the ones that are out there working on computers to find those different blocks that are available for using for transactions. And they verify it. When they verify those transactions, those are, are give it, given a value. And so the, the, uh, the, it's, it's known as a proof of work. So, so when the miner finds that particular um, uh, algorithm that responds correctly to the hash that they have collected, that they've put together, and they can see that it will work to handle a transaction, that gets set as a proof of work. And that then is translated into the Bitcoin that is known as the reward. So, so that once they've, they've found that formula that works and they've codified it and it's put into the blockchain and the blockchain recognizes it and says, okay, this transaction is secured for our blockchain that spits out or returns back this Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency system you're working with, it will give you that as a, as a, a notification saying, you now have this particular spot on our blockchain reserved for, the, for your transactions. And you can use this code to access this part of the blockchain for your transaction. That's your reward. And that's how you use that particular Bitcoin to then sell to other people, buy and sell to other people. That's what miners do. So cryptocurrency mining, it's complicated. And this diagram is the simplest way that I could actually explain how it works. But hopefully it's something that, I mean, it's important to know because People do have careers as cryptocurrency miners, um, but it's it's not easy. I mean, it is and it isn't. It's it's anyone can do it. The 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 it's much like panning for gold. You have to go out there and work on it a huge amount of time to get returns on a cryptocurrency blockchain. Because most of the people now, the simple stuff, much like panning for gold, the, the gold that was in the stream that was right there in the 1800s all got picked up. And now, you know, you, there's still gold there, but you have to mine a lot harder now and work a lot longer to get the same amount of uh, uh, return. And so um, miners, as we can see it sort of goes in this row here that it starts with verifying that the transactions are valid. Then they bundle the transactions into a block. Then they take the hash of preceding blocks 
and insert it into a new block. Then they create a new blockchain and they put it onto the network. When a problem is solved, they add the new block to a blockchain chain, and that gives them the proof of work that they can use to then claim that they get the cryptocurrency unit from the cryptocurrency provider. And so that's kind of the cycle. But it takes not just computing power to do this, but it takes energy and it takes time. And so it's not free. Even though the software to mine is free, the actual effort that it takes your computer system to mine is not free. So that is where we do run into a problem. Um, so there's the real cost behind mining Bitcoin. And that is, uh, it, it, it does change over time. The more popular Bitcoin gets, kind of like real mining, the more popular that, that, that Bitcoin gets. And because it's a limited quality, quantity, the uh, 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 more um, uh, energy it takes to come up with just one unique transaction number that will respond to the hash formula that they have. And so the hash rate on the network, in other words, the computing power that people are spending on it, grows drastically over time and fluctuates with Bitcoin's price. So this begs the question, if Bitcoin continues to rise in popularity and price, how much more power will it be consumed and will it be worth the environmental cost? Because it's Bitcoin, its rarity drives up its value. But when Bitcoin becomes too expensive, other competitors towards Bitcoin will create their own cyber currency. And that will then reduce Bitcoin's rarity as far as their ability to corner the market on these kind of transactions, these kind of uh, 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 low cost wire transfer style transaction. And so the, uh, the other cyber currencies dilute the market and lower the price of Bitcoin, which then reduces the number of people that are trying to mine Bitcoin. They'd rather go mine other currencies that might be worth more money for the same time. But then it spreads it across the network and involves more people, therefore using more energy. So that's a big question and something that will, again, be adjusted over time, especially when technology evolves to a point where doing these kind of cryptocurrency mining doesn't cost as much energy. We'll see how much it's used then, or, or maybe that might lead to an explosion of cryptocurrency. Who knows? Um, here they're saying that in 2020, when we're recording this, um, that, that a Bitcoin network um, consumes 120 gigawatts per second, and that's 20, 63 terawatts per year. And then one gigahash per second is one watt, and a terahash is one kilowatt, and a petahash, which is, um, uh, what, eight, or no, uh, 16, uh, is one megawatt. And then exahash on top of that is a gigawatt. In other words, the staggering amount of this is the equivalent to uh, uh, 449 thousand four hundred and forty wind turbines generating peak power per second so so basically we're using a lot of power to try to reach these currency goals we're trying to mine this currency it's kind of weird to think about how it has a huge physical impact for something that doesn't actually physically exist. It, it does sometimes mystify me about all this kind of effort being put into something that is all virtual, yet it has a solid effect on the world around us because of something like this.
regardless of the number of miners, it still takes 10 minutes to mine one Bitcoin. At 600 seconds, all else being equal, it will take 72,000 gigawatts or 72 terawatts of power to mine a Bitcoin using the average power provided by the, the current number of ASIC mine. So there is... But if it gets more popular, will the network even be able to handle a crazy number of more miners? People try to do it. Uh, I know that a number of people have tried it and realized that, that, you know, with what they were getting as far as Bitcoins were concerned, you know, because they had low powered systems, they were having to spend, you know, um, uh, uh, thousands of dollars per hour, you know, per, per, per year to only, you know, get, you know, a couple of, of uh, Bitcoins so at the time were not very valuable. So, you know, um, and, and uh, the fact that it takes 10 minutes to mine a Bitcoin is still provided that you can find that particular spot that is available. And that is what takes more time. It's not just the 10 minute, the, it's once you've found the Bitcoin, then you can, or once you've found that formula, then you can, in 10 minutes, turn it into a Bitcoin. But finding it takes a lot more effort and not so easy for most people. Uh, but in February of 2020, Bitcoin was legal in the US, Japan, UK, Canada, and a lot of other developed countries. In emerging markets, the legal status of Bitcoin still varies dramatically. So China has heavily restricted Bitcoin, but it hasn't criminalized them. And in India, India banned banks from dealing in Bitcoins and left the overall legal status of cryptocurrencies unclear. In general, you have to look at Bitcoin laws in specific countries to see where it is legal and how it's treated. Um, even where Bitcoin is legal, most of the laws that apply to other assets also apply to Bitcoin. The tax laws are in the area where most people are run into trouble. And for tax purposes, for the most part, Bitcoins are treated usually as property rather than currency. So that allows them to be taxed in property tax way, which is usually a lot higher than, say, an income tax, and you can't quite deduct from it in a lot of ways. I'm not a tax attorney, but this is, you know, one of the things that uh, is going on. So um, Bitcoin is not considered legal tender because it isn't backed by any government. So, in other words, you know, you are at your own risk while you're using it. And if you choose to use it at, you, to accept Bitcoin as a monetary system, you have no guarantees that it can be honored. You just have to basically believe in the system that is behind Bitcoin to make sure that it continues to, to function. So let's talk about some cases that involve Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. We do you as you would imagine, it's certainly something that they can something like this can spark litigation. And there are 11 lawsuits that allege that the tokens were unregistered securities and that their issuers failed to follow appropriate registration requirements. And the token exchanges violate exchange and broker dealer registration it's it's argued that that could be the case um and it's kind of hard to say that maybe they aren't uh you know it's when you're getting a blockchain are you getting a share of something like you were a stock it's 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 very hard to define this is why you know as i said what is being done with with Bitcoin truly is revolutionizing the way we think about money, you know, on all these different levels. Is it a stock? Is it a, a currency? Is it a property? Is it an asset? What is it? 
and and we're finding it falls through a lot of different cracks here and so you you in this 11 lawsuits the binance buybox bitmex kucoin uh tron block one bancor civic Kybercoin, status quant stamp were all named as one of the you know complaints complainants or the, what they were named in the complaint to uh, 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 be listed as uh, broker dealers instead of just uh, uh, providers of blockchains that just basically treat them like they're any other service. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, they're also said said that the uh they're it's been compared to the mortgage crisis in a lot of ways but you know that people have invested a lot of money in certain uh cryptocurrencies that haven't paid off at times but as always there is um uh, uh you know both sides to it uh what was said by um Philippe Sen- Salendi is that the alleged pattern of misconduct by, misconduct by exchanges and issuers yielded billions in profits for wrongdoers through a basic betrayal of public trust. So, and part of that is A, that these are not regulated so that some of these um, issuers, some of these exchanges, have just taken the money and run. But some of them, mostly the ones that still are operating he feels have not paid their fair share in taxes to the particular states and the particular countries in which they operate and that that they should be able to get away with that in the same way that a company shouldn't be able to sell stock and not have to pay and be regulated by a stock exchange there's also a lot of uh Questions about the fees and uh, whether the fees that they that they get from the management of these digital assets are legal, um, and that sometimes, like for instance, Binance was sued for saying that they took in more than one million dollars in, in fees, and um, uh, Block One acknowledged lawsuits said that we're aware of the opportun- opportunistic complaints filed against blockchain. And cryptography uh, cryptocurrency companies we have not been served with any claims but we're well prepared to address anything that may arise there they feel that the complaints that are being said are mainly from banks and stock companies, stock brokerages that feel that they are being territorial and trying to stop a new form of currency that they have no business of and they cannot control and so we're seeing sort of a loggerhead coming between is this for the betterment and good of society to have these kind of cryptocurrencies available people believe in them should they be able to believe in them and 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 put their money in them or i mean is that part of capitalism is that part of a free society as far as money is concerned or is this something that will be a pandora's box and once we open it we're not going to be able to shut again currency will get out of hand and the dollar itself will lose stability as well as other world currencies and we will governments themselves won't be able to collect taxes at one point in time based on everything being done through cyber currency and not needing banks and or governments to manage their money for them. And that is a really central argument to the existence of governments as a whole. So you can see where there are some very heated opinions on both sides of the aisle. Uh, In September, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, settled charges against Block One for conducting what the commission called an unregistered initial coin offer, offering of digital tokens that raised the equivalent 
several billion dollars, according to a press release. And as we know, you know, if one way you can get away from actually coming up with a judgment on something is when you pay $24 million civil penalty. So there, but the, the problem with that is that no particular law was, was set. There was no precedence actually set. It just basically, the company agreed to settle the charges. So we don't have a law now that directly states that there, that, that these things are, are illegal or that by their very nature, the fees they charge, or what types of fees they charge are illegal. It just is, the company never agreed to, to claim that they were in purposely committing any unlawful acts by settling the charges, um, even though it was a huge civil penalty, they still didn't um, um, say that the foundation of what they were doing was illegal. But one thing that is illegal are Bitcoin Ponzi schemes. And in a recent case, uh, SEC versus Shavers, the organization for, of an alleged Ponzi scheme advertised a Bitcoin investment opportunity in an online Bitcoin forum. Investors were allegedly promised up to 7% interest per week and that the invested funds would be used for Bitcoin arbitrage activities in order to generate the return. Well, right there, there should have been a gigantic red flag to anybody that is interested in investing in Bitcoin. When you see a return that is outlandish and is claiming something that is truly too good to be true, 7% interest per year would be pretty nice. 7% um, interest per month would make me wonder. 7% interest per week, that is something that is simply untenable. And a little bird should pop up on your shoulder and tell you that this is not something you should be putting your money into. But people did. And instead, the invested Bitcoins were allegedly used to pay existing investors in exchange the U.S. dollars to pay the organizers personal expenses, which we see in a lot of cases because, again, the unregulated nature of Bitcoin and cyber currencies uh, 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 cryptocurrencies are easily turned into something that can be a scam like this. And if you've got the ability to avoid governmental regulation, it opens the door for people to do these kinds of schemes and get away with some very crazy particular um, uh, scams based on it being so ephemeral and beyond most people's technical understandings as to how it even works. I mean, I spent a good like half of this lecture just explaining how Bitcoin works. And even then, I'm still a little fuzzy on it. It's not an easy subject to put your mind around. And if you're gonna invest a lot of money in something, it's hard to invest in something that you really don't understand. So here's a list of common red flags of fraud that many Ponzi schemes share in common. Okay, so for instance, high investment returns with little or no risk. Every investment has some kind of risk. And investments that are guaranteed, um, are, they say that there's no risk at all, are probably the riskiest ones of all. So um, really, you should be thinking, you know, if it's too good to be true, if this is, it's, nobody gives you free money. Right? You don't get money for free anyway. And there are good investments, you know, but those are ones that do take time to show that they've, been, they've paid off over the long period of time, as opposed to just something that, you know, has only been around maybe in some of these cases, companies maybe for a few months. So um, overly consistent returns. So 
investments that tend to go up and down over time, especially those seeking high returns. But when an investment, someone says that investment will get consistent returns regardless of overall market conditions, then you got to worry about it. And there is no cryptocurrency that exists that is immune from losing its value. Okay. There are, and there are a number of ways that it can lose its value without anything that you have done or even anything you could predict seeing. As we talked about, when a cryptocurrency gets overmined, the value of that particular cryptocurrency, the blockchain gets too long, the cryptocurrency value drops. Um, or if people suddenly stop seeing the value of that cryptocurrency, it will go away. And most importantly, if the cryptocurrency gets hacked and its reputation for being a reliable and secure uh, space for transactions goes away, then the cryptocurrency itself could completely collapse. And finally, cryptocurrency could also just be poorly managed badly through software and other means and by lack of management it could fall apart and everything go away and we'll talk about one other case in the end which uh uh is a worst case scenario for anyone that puts money in cryptocurrency and unregistered investments ponzi schemes involve investments that have not been registered with the sec with state regulators as we talked about Bitcoin and so forth, they aren't part of the SEC or regulated in most cases. So, you know, you really take a risk when you, you uh, are investing in Bitcoin, especially one or in a, a cryptocurrency, especially one that isn't well established and doesn't have much of a reputation. So uh, many federal, state and securities laws require investment professionals be licensed or registered, but people who sell Bitcoin are not registered in any way, shape, or form, or most of them are not. And so you're really taking a risk by going with an unlicensed seller. Um, there are secretive and complex strategies and fee structures. It's a good idea on a rule of thumb to avoid, avoid investments you don't understand or you can't get complete information. When there's no minimum investor qualifications can be a real danger sign. So most legitimate private investment opportunities need you to be an accredited investor. You should be highly skeptical of investment opportunities. But don't ask about your salary or net worth. They just want your money. Issues with paperwork. Uh, when you can't review information about the investment in writing or at least online, be able to really look at how it works and being able to consider the, the investment's prospectus and looking out for errors and count statements so that you could see that there's fraudulent activity. Again, those things can be very hard to do with a, uh, a, a, a cryptocurrency company. Um, and then if you're getting, if you're getting difficulty and you know people that are, that have been with this, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, company, but haven't been able to get payments. And so, in other words, if you don't receive a payment or have difficulty cashing, cashing out on your investment, Ponzi scheme organizers encourage participants to roll over promised payments by offering higher investment returns. So in other words, they're not giving you your money back. They just give you more credit for it and say your investment is worth more without ever actually giving you anything back on your investment. Eventually, that's a Ponzi scheme that bought the bubble pops because you're having your money go to pay somebody else and somebody else is being looked to to pay for your money and so forth. And then when it comes with, through someone with a shared affinity. So fraudsters often exploit trust derived from being members of a group that shares an affinity such as a, a national ethnic religious affiliation, uh, family members, um, uh, uh, respected leaders, um, other, you know, prominent members of the media or maybe even athletes. And they are, uh, uh, told to spread word about the investment. And so if it, 
feels like you're being, you know, emotionally manipulated to get to, to invest in a cryptocurrency. Um, if you feel like you're having somebody, you know, tell you all the, the, the wonderful rewards of it and tell you how great it is to, to, to do this. And there's never any risk. It's nothing but just all you have to do is give them your money. And in another month, you'll be rich beyond your wildest dreams. You have to be worried about that. It's often not true. So what's the worst that can happen? Well, sometimes cryptocurrency fails. Major problem in the crypto market is the lack of innovation by developers. There have been multiple launches of the new Bitcoin, despite the fact that Bitcoin is still heavily in demand. Since the market doesn't need a new Bitcoin, a lot of these coins inevitably fail. Again, something is only worth what someone believes it is worth. So, for instance, you know, my, my New Mutants comic book is not worth very much. And then they decided to make a New Mutants movie, which I heard made the comic book worth quite a bit. But then I heard the New Mutants movie was horrible. And so now the comic is back down to being what it was before the movie came. So you never really know where the perception is going to go on your investment when it isn't something that doesn't have a history behind it the way that, say, gold or silver or the stock of a well-known company does. If you throw your money behind something that was only around last week, you're never really sure that it's going to be there even next week in the world of Bitcoin, in the world of, of cyber coin. In fact, here's, here's the top five cryptocurrency failures. You have Get Gems, which was called Gems back in 2014, but it got no momentum. And even though people poured in $111,000 to it, it just completely fell apart. And um, even though it, it technically is an online ad form, ad form, the people who put the money into it never got their money back. Space bit. This cryptocurrency was got a lot of publicity in 2014, um, but they were supposed to um, launch a nano satellite, and that was going to support the infrastructure. But um, they had all the, the the bits to put the crypto in place. They just never put it together, and then suddenly they just stopped streaming after a while. And whoever invested in them didn't get their money back. Paycoin had a uh, a a, a lot of visibility and the there were some uh respected crypto miners who uh went in got were involved but there was such a rushed attempt to uh get it onto the market it was uh its security wasn't really up to par and um when the the promises were not met to get its security back up, it failed and nobody invested it. Uh, Dogecoin um, was another uh, uh, situation where uh, they wanted to give a charitable approach, but uh, uh, it was short-lived when the uh, founder just decided to shut it down um, arbitrarily. And once he shut down the exchange, um, funds disappeared and the uh of course nobody could find where the guy was and you know that unfortunately turned out just to be a big scam and then there's the ethereum's dao which is the decentralized autonomous organization trying to create a particular um uh, system its own system and it did exist in 2016 um, but it was just way too ambitious for what it, it was supposed to be. And it didn't actually pay off in, what it, in, in its ability to function and become its own um, cryptography, cryptocurrency system by itself. And uh, the investors lost $168 million, um, uh, because one... At one point in time, a $50 million hack um, occurred 
and that the people's people's faith in the ability for Ethereum to protect itself from bigger hacks uh, uh, failed, and uh, people withdrew their money and it collapsed. So and then, finally, um, probably the worst case scenario can happen is that the cryptocurrency known as Quadriga CX, and it's Canada's largest exchange, they were unable to access the password or recovery key after the guy who created it died in, in, of, in December. So about $190 million in cryptocurrency has been locked away in an online black hole as the founder of a currency exchange died, apparently taking his encrypted access to their money with him. According to court filing, cryptocurrency news and exchange um, had $190 million in cash and cryptocurrency held in cold storage. Quadriga's inventory of cryptocurrency has become unavailable and some of it may be lost, Robertson wrote in the file. When you put all your money in the hands of somebody, one person, and that person has that code with them and it's not written down anywhere and that encryption code is not available to anybody else if that person dies you are locked out of your money and that is what happened to 190 million dollars the the encryption is so good nobody can break it they might be able to break it you know 20 years from now when computing power gets strong enough to be able to get past and hack this level of security but right now it's locked away and it might as well be at the bottom of the ocean or on the surface of the moon because nobody can access it without having that um, uh, password that a recovery key that's needed to exchange to get into that exchange. And so that's another risk too. You're never quite sure if some you get locked out of your money because something like this happened. So some conclusions here. Cryptocurrencies are attracted to creating a decentralized monetary system. It takes time and energy to, and money to mine cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrencies have no government backing and have no way of guaranteeing payment. Cryptocurrencies can be easily manipulated into a Ponzi scheme, and you can be hacked or locked out. Its attraction is easy money, but it comes at a risk or a price. And if you don't understand it, you probably shouldn't invest. If you have questions or any uh, comments, please contact me. Um, and I really appreciate you folks listening to today's talk. Thank you very much.